In this episode, we're setting up damage and health mechanics for our player character. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and today we're getting started on two mechanics that are universal to pretty much every RPG, and those are damage and health. And by no means are we going to exhaust the full possibilities of what we're going to do in this series in regards to these two topics, but really we're getting started today. And when we started our gameplay ability system in episode 26, I had a slide that looked very similar to this, and I figured this was a good representation of how we want to conceptualize damage mechanics. Because the way I'm thinking about it is the stuff on the left-hand side of the screen, this is stuff that's occurring exactly when the damage actually occurs. And then for the stuff on the right of the screen, this is stuff that's happening over time, just continuously telling the player, okay, here's how damaged you are. And there's stuff that's purely aesthetic, like there's things happening on the screen, there's sounds that are playing that are indicators, but then there's also the actual dynamics of the game, like how injuries are going to affect gameplay. At a minimum, realistically, the player needs to know that they're damaged. And it's also a good idea that the player knows how much they're damaged. Because truth be told, vulnerability in life and in games, that dictates behavior. You're not going to take a really risky action in a game, well, unless you're reckless, if you're close to death already. But more than that, I've talked about this before, but we really want to give the player a sense of presence. Like they and their character, they're closely connected. And so I've listed out here a lot of the common ways that damage is indicated, but what we're doing in this episode, I've circled in red here. And specifically for this series, I'm going to keep it family friendly. We're not going to have blood effects in this series. But even without blood and blood effects, I'm still convinced that throughout this series and with the game that we're making, we're still going to give that player that gripping sense of presence, that they're really connected to this character. So the things that I've circled in red here we're doing today, but there are two other things that we're doing next episode, which are our post-process effects for being in a damaged state. We're going to kind of have a red border around the screen and then also we're going to have a slight flickering like a darkening when the player immediately takes damage and my key rule with stuff like this is it needs to be gripping but it cannot cross over into annoying so if i find that a certain effect is annoying and that's why i went with heartbeat sounds versus heavy breathing i just find the heavy breathing that much more annoying so here are all the free animations and sounds used this episode. A lot of these you can get from Mixmo or Zapsplat, but the pain vocalizations, I know typically we call them grunts, but the pain vocalizations, uh, they're from yours truly. So feel free to use them whatever capacity you want. And as always, you can find a link to all this stuff in the spreadsheet that's linked in the description below. So we're gonna to start today by setting up our health system. And for that, we're going to go into our third person character blueprint. So mine's under the core folder here and BP third person character. And within this, I'm gonna create two new variables. So under variables here, I'll hit plus sign. And the first one is going to be our max health. And this one's going to be afloat. Actually, both of them are gonna be afloat, but this is gonna be our maximum health that the player can have. And this could change throughout a game as a player gets boosts and things like that. But then the second variable that we're gonna create if I hit plus sign is going to be our current health. And that's also going to be afloat. So then I'm going to compile and save. And when I do that, then I can set the default values for these. So max health is gonna be 100. And our current health is also going to have a default value of 100. And so now we're going to set up the passing of damage. And for any damage that's passed into our character, this is going to be done with what's called a damage event. Now you can think of a million different things in games that could do damage. The player could be burned, they could be frozen, they could be hit with something. But in our case, we're going to build on what we set up the last three episodes, which is our gameplay ability for basically having a jump and speed boost being up very high. And we're going to set it so that if the player hits the ground too hard, that's going to create damage for our player. So keeping with my general strategy for events on our third person character, we're just doing this chronologically. So I'm going to go down to the bottom of our events and then we'll right click and I'm going to search for damage and I'll scroll up a little bit and you'll see here that we have three damage events. We have this any damage point damage and radial damage. Now there's this great blog post on damage that you can find on the Unreal Engine website. And this paragraph here I think is particularly important. Basically damage support is a general feature in Unreal Engine, but there's not specific support for specific concepts. So things like life, health, hit points, stuff like that doesn't exist. And they say, meaning you won't find any notion of hit points or death in the engine. These concepts tend to be very game specific and we found that attempts to generalize them end up causing more pain than they prevent but they do provide a little bit of a framework with the three types of damage. So if you come down here a little bit further, so we have our point damage event, we have a radial damage event and a general damage event. And what we're gonna do for the fall damage is this general damage event. And it says, this is the most generic damage model available containing only an optional damage type class. And really the deciding factor on which of these three to use is how specific you want to be with the damage. So if the damage is affecting a very specific part of the body, 
then we're going to want to use the point damage event. And if the damage is emanating from a particular place, like an explosion, for instance, then we're going to do a radial damage event. But for fall damage, I'm just going to keep it very generic. We're going to use this one here. So back on this list here in our blueprint, we're going to do event any damage. And we'll see on that event, we have the damage, which is just a float. We have the damage type. We have instigated by and the damage causer. So you can refer back to the website. They have good information on each of these, like what the damage causer is and the instigator. We're not going to worry about those in this case because we're just starting with the basics. And also we're just setting this up initially for fall damage, which is really not going to have an instigator. But this is going to be really helpful, I think, in the future when there are multiple targets that could be attacked by AI, because then the AI is going to have to determine, oh, the damage that was caused to me, that came from this person or this character versus the player character. And the damage type is also going to be useful because depending on the type of damage, you might want the character to react differently. So if the character is taking fire damage, for instance, they might have one animation like stop, drop and roll. If they're taking ice damage, they're going to be shivering in the cold. So depending on exactly what's going on, you're going to want that character to respond differently to the damage. But for now, if I go back to our third person character, so we're going to keep this very simple. So we're going to get our current health. I'm going to drag in a reference to that. And then from that, what we're going to do is subtract the damage from our current health. So this is any time damage occurs on our player, it's going to pass into this event. And we're going to subtract that damage directly from our current health. And that's going to then set our current health to the new value. So set and connect this up here and connect this up right there. Now we're keeping this really basic, but in certain cases, like if the player has armor or if they have fire protection or stuff like that, you're going to have all sorts of modifiers between this and when the current health actually gets set. And then right after this, so right after we set the current health, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to assess, okay, is this greater than zero? Because what typically happens if the player's current health drops below zero? So in physical reality, we typically call that a death. Uh, but in the game that we're looking to make here, it's going to be a little bit different than normal. So keep death on ice. We're going to come back to it, but not this episode. But if the player's health is not below zero, meaning this is true, then we want to have various effects occur, right? So the player emits a sound of some kind, a vocalization, or they play an animation, they react in some way. But before we do that, we first have to set up what's going to trigger this event any damage. So for that, let's compile and save and we'll go into our animation blueprint. So that's back to my content drawer. My animation blueprints under my core folder right here. And I'm going to go over to our event graph. So last episode, we set up fall effects. So effects that occur to the player when they fall or they hit the ground at a weird angle. And the way we did that is we did that based on our vertical impact force here and then facing direction of velocity. And just to zoom out and show you what this is doing. So this is being called every single tick. And what we're doing is we're getting our current velocity, comparing that to the previous velocity and just getting the Z of that. So every single tick, we're determining what was the current vertical impact force. So then what we did last episode, if we go back to our main state state machine, so when we're landing, we assessed, okay, is it going to exceed a certain threshold? Is the vertical impact force going to exceed 1500? Because if it does exceed 1500, then we do this hard landing straight down, or we do this hard landing roll, depending on the situation. So I'm not going to go back into that, but we're going to use that same vertical impact force if it exceeds 1500 to determine whether or not we're going to pass damage to our character. The idea being if you're hitting beyond that 1500 threshold is that you're hitting the ground hard enough that it's going to do damage. So back over to our event graph. So we're going to go to the end of this chain of events. And then after we set our previous velocity, then we're going to get under essential movement data. Here's where I classified it, our vertical impact force. And we're going to assess, okay, is that vertical impact force greater than 1500? Because if it is greater than 1500, that's when we're going to pass damage. So we'll branch from this, connect this up. And then from the true branch here, that's when we're going to pass damage. So we got to get a reference to our character. So I can get a reference to our character here. And then I can call the apply damage event. And by the way, if you wanted to apply radial damage or point damage, you do it the same way. So you would apply and then you got point damage and radial damage right there. So I'll connect up true right here, move character over a little bit. And then for the actual damage that we're going to apply. So this is going to be a little unique. But what I'm doing is I'm going to get the square root of our vertical impact force that's greater than 1500. So I just search for square root and then from that square root pin, I'll just do a minus. So if I go down here, get the subtract and then I can get a reference to our vertical impact force, get connect this up and it's going to be subtracting 1500. 
And because this is just about the most generic type of damage, fall damage, we're not going to do a damage type class at this point, and we're also not going to do an event instigator or damage causer. So mathematically, the way this is going to work is if they hit with the maximum impact force, I think it's something like 3,000 if the player falls from the highest height. So 3,000 minus 1,500 is obviously 1,500, and then we can get the square root of that, and it's going to do about 38.72 damage. So if they do this three times, even with 100 health, they're going to die. So let's compile and save this, and then back in our third person character, all I'm gonna do is from the true branch here, we're gonna do a print string, and we can actually print to see how much damage we're doing. So from here, I'm just gonna do an append, and then I'm just gonna say damage taken. And in the B, this is where I'm going to get what our damage was. So from here, I'll drag out a pin and boom, and connect that up. So compile and save this, and let's test it out. So if you haven't been following along with this series, then you're not going to be able to test in the way I'm testing, which is just with my air ability here. But you just need to start playing at a very high place and then drop and see what prints. Boom. And then in the top left corner, damage taken 23.7. So now we get to the first indicator that the player actually took damage. And for this, we're going to do a vocalization, also known as a grunt. And as much as I might regret this, I recorded these myself and they are available to download to you. There are links in the description below via the spreadsheet. And let me just show you how I organize these. So there's light, medium, and heavy intensity. So if we go to content, we go to sound, into our character, and then under human, I created two different folders. We'll get to heartbeats, but I created this folder for vocalizations. And then specifically, I created a folder for damage taken. So we have a bunch of heavy grunts. I created a sound cue for those. Same with light grunts, same with our medium grunts. And we also created three different attenuation settings. So let's start with heavy and go from there. So I believe I kept the volume multiplier for these exactly as is, but feel free to change it as needed. So just make sure for each of these that the sound does not loop because you'll find that particularly annoying. And then for the attenuation settings, let me just show you that. You can also check out episode 17 on environmental sound. I go over a lot of this basic sound stuff, like attenuation. And here we got an inner radius of 100, fall off distance 1900, binaural, which is better with headphones, and binaural radius is 200, 200, 200. So here's our light cue, same exact thing. Light attenuation, it's just a much shorter fall off distance. And then the medium cue, same exact kind of setup, but for the attenuation, that fall off distance is 1400. And here's what this sounds like. I'm not a voice actor, but I do my best. But then we actually have a key question, which is, do we want which sound plays to be based on how much damage was taken in that moment or how much health our player has after the damage? So I'm going to do it based on how much health the player actually has, meaning even if it was a small hit, if they're already at low health, then it's going to play that heavy vocalization. And I thought about doing this setup on a blueprint function library, but I realized that it's only going to be our player character that has these sounds. Now, there might be other characters with another set of sounds, but we would set that up on a blueprint function library separately. And so for that reason, we're going to set this up directly on our third person character blueprint. So I'm going to go over there and now I can delete out this node. I can also delete out our two print string nodes. And then I'm going to get our current health. And from that, we are going to divide. We're going to divide our current health by our maximum health because we want to get a proportion of how much health we have left. And then I'm going to check to see, is this greater than 0.7? So are we at more than 70% health? And then we'll branch from that. Hook up the true from here to there. Just gonna move these three over a little bit, move this a little closer. And we're gonna end up using this health ratio quite a bit. So I'm just gonna select these three. I'm gonna right click, we're gonna collapse this to a macro. And I'm gonna right click, rename the macro. It's gonna be our current health ratio. And so 70% is gonna be our threshold for the lightest vocalization. But then our next threshold is gonna be 40%. So I'm gonna copy both those nodes, paste. I'm gonna change this to 0.4. We are gonna branch off of this and we'll connect up the false pin to this branch. And then the next thing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a reference to our mesh. And from our mesh, we are going to spawn a sound attached. And the reason I'm attaching is because it should play from our face, right? It should play from that general vicinity. So connect up the true pin. And for this, for the lightest vocalization, this is going to be our grunts one light. So grunts one, come down to our light cue. And I'm going to expand this in the attach point name. This is going to be our head and where I'm getting this from. If I go back to my animation blueprint, go back to our skeleton. So of all these different bones, let me collapse the pelvis. Actually, I can't collapse the pelvis. So if I scroll down, 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 down and look for our neck bone and our head bone. So our head bone is literally like right where the voice would come from. So that's where I'm getting that. So back in our third person character blueprint, put an attach point name of head. And the other thing is just make sure auto destroy here is checked. We don't need to assign attenuation settings or any other things here because we've already got that in the sound queue. And then all I'm gonna do, cause this is basically a fire and forget sound from this pin, I'm just gonna say play. 
And for the other two types of sounds, I'm just going to select these. I'll paste them again, connect up the true here. This is going to be our medium sound. So grunts one medium, come down, select our cue. And then we'll do the same thing, but for our heavy sounds, the most embarrassing sounds, grunts one heavy. And I'm just going to move these out to line them up. So let's compile and save and let's test this out. All right, so there should be light damage to start. And now let's try doing some more damage. And heavy damage, here we go. So far so good. So all this on our third person character blueprint, this looks pretty messy, right? So let's collapse all this sound setup to a function. So I'll highlight all this, highlight all this as well. And then I'll right click and I'll say collapse to function, move this over here. And the function, I'm just gonna right click, rename, it's gonna be titled took damage sound effect. And then we'll give it a category, we'll give it a new category of received damage. And just to make some space between this and my pickup stuff up here, I'm just gonna move this down, down, down there. So now let's set up the recovery of health over time. And I think in the RPG that I have in mind, there are going to be spells and abilities or certain things that the player can run into and regain health or regain health at a faster rate. But what I want to set up right now is just a simple heal over time mechanic. So we're going to start by creating a brand new function. So plus sign, and it's going to be called increment health recovery. And I'm going to give this a category under category here. We're going to categorize it under health. And I think at the same time, we're going to go to our health variables here and also categorize these under health. So first with this function, we need to assess, okay, is our current health less than our max health? So I can drag in a reference to our current health and drag in a reference to our max health. And we're going to compare these two. So is this less than max health? Because if this is true, then we're going to increment our health by one. So I'm going to connect this up. And then what I'm going to do is get our current health and then I'm going to increment it. So we're going to add just one to our current health, but we're going to clamp this. So we're going to do a clamp, clamp float, and it's going to be clamped between zero and whatever our max health is. And then from this, I can set our current health. So set current health. Now, just temporarily, what we're going to do is a print string right after this, just to watch and make sure that our health actually does recover. So from the print string, I'm going to append, and this is going to be our current health. And here I'm going to connect up our current health. But now the way I envision this mechanic working is that it's going to repeat this function every one second on the dot, every single second of gameplay. And so the way we're going to do that is from the print string here, we're going to do a set timer by function name just like previous episodes. So we'll right click here, rename, get that exact name, paste it into the function name. Time's gonna be one second. And then also if this is false, we still want this function to repeat because we want it to assess whether or not it's gonna increment every single one second regardless. But the last thing we have to do before we test this is we have to call this function to actually start the mechanic. So that's gonna be done on begin play. So if we go back to our event graph, all the way up, all the way up to this chain of events, and even if you don't have all this stuff on event begin play, you just need to make sure to put an event begin play. And then at the very end of this chain of events, then we're going to call that function increment health recovery. So compile and save, and we are ready to test this out. So it's only going to print something on the screen if our current health is less than our max health. So in order for that to happen, we need to take damage. So let's zoom out. Drop. Yeah. And there we go, we see it, current health, incrementing, incrementing, it should hit 100 and then stop. 99, 100, no more printing. But the next thing I wanna set up, it's a common mechanic in a lot of games, and that is when the player takes damage, I want some period of time, basically a pause, where the player's automatic healing doesn't occur. And I'm going to make that pause five seconds. So the way we're going to do that is if we go back into our third person character blueprint, and I'm gonna zoom back out, back down to where we took damage, so all the way down here. So right after the took damage sound effect, we are going to pause a timer. And the timer that we're going to pause is the one that's running every one second for increment health recovery. So we can say pause timer by function name, and we can get the function name the same way. So paste that in. And then the question is, well, how do we make that mechanic only last five seconds? And if they get injured again, how do we ensure that that five seconds gets extended an additional five seconds? And so the way I'm gonna do that, very simple, it's with retriggerable delay. Because if the trigger happens again, meaning they get injured again, then it's gonna go right back pausing and have another five seconds. And then once that five seconds does pass where they don't get injured, then we are going to unpause timer by function name. And same thing, right click, rename, copy, and this is just an easy way to get the exact function name. So let's compile and save, and another test. We should have a five second delay after we get injured. 
Raising, 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 and fall. Two, three, four, five. Top left corner. There we go. 74, 75, 76, 77. Perfect. Looking good. So now I want to put in what I've seen to be a common game mechanic in RPGs, which is as the player takes damage, their speed decreases, their maximum speed decreases relative to the amount of damage that they've taken. And the way we're going to control this is on the character movement component on our third person character. So I'll go back to our third person character. And we're actually going to do this directly in the increment health recovery function. And the reason we're going to do it on this function is we want our player's movement speed to go back to normal as the player's health rises back up to full. So from here, what we can do to start is I'm going to delete out all the print string stuff. We don't need that anymore. Connect this up. And actually, I'm going to disconnect this because instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leverage the setup that we did two episodes ago. And that was the air ability speed boost or assess air ability speed boost. And we'll connect this up just like this. Now, let me show you what this is doing just so you could see it. The reason we're using this function is we don't need to recreate the wheel. It's already doing the heavy lifting required to assess whether or not our speed boost is active and what our player's speed should be. And if you want to check out the episodes where we did this, it's episodes 39 and 40, basically three and two episodes ago. But now we need to modify this function a bit because we need to take damage into account in figuring out what our max walk speed should be. And the way I'm envisioning this is that the player's speed should never drop below 50% of their typical maximum. So if the player's health is really, really low, like almost dead, then they should be running at roughly 50, 51% of speed. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm just going to make some space here. I'm also going to drag down this comment a little bit, drag all of this down, because what we need to do is we need to start by getting our current health ratio. And because I don't want the speed to be reduced down to nothing, I basically want it to be reduced down to 50%. We're going to divide this by two and that's gonna make the effect half as much. And then we're gonna to add to 0.5, so plus, and I'll connect this here, I'll disconnect this one, this is gonna be 0.5. And so now I'm gonna disconnect our base run speed here, move it up here, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply it right here. Actually, I'm just gonna connect this to that, this to that, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move over to the right, we're gonna extend out this comment just a little bit, because we're gonna take this multiplication, connect this up here, and then I'm just gonna move the rest of these into position. So character movement, move this over. This will move over here. These two move over a little bit. Let me kind of explain what this is doing. So this is taking our activated gameplay ability. Let's say it has an intensity of 100. So then it's dividing that by 100 and that gets us one. So the activated gameplay ability, that's our air ability, gets us a 2.5 times speed boost. But that 2.5 times speed boost is the speed boost of our current health ratio divided by two plus 0 0.5 multiplied by our base run speed. So if our current health is 50% divided by 2.25 plus 0 0.5, so base run speed is 500, multiply that by 0.75, you have roughly a speed of 380, something like that. But then if you've got an activated gameplay ability and then it multiplies by 2.5, you get the idea. That's a little bit complicated, totally understand. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of this stuff and right click, we're gonna collapse this to a macro. So this macro is going to be called, if we rename, it's gonna be damage based max run speed. So then I'll drag these all over and I'll move this one over and we can shrink this considerably. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna right click on the macro and duplicate this because we're gonna call this one max walk speed. And I'll get rid of the underscore zero all the way at the end there. And for this macro, well, it's gonna be the same thing except instead of base run speed, we are going to get under movement our base walk speed. And this is also something that we set up, it was three episodes ago. And the reason we need damage base max walk speed is if I go back to our under movement, our air ability speed boost, this one, assess air ability speed boost function. So we need to take that same macro max walk speed and we're gonna apply that to if the player's walking. So right here, so instead of base walk speed, it's going to take damage into account. So we'll connect this up just like this and base run speed, we can just use our damage based max run speed. And there we go. And lastly, because we now have five macros on our third person character, it's kind of my limit before I start categorizing. So what we're gonna do is the damage base max run speed, we're gonna categorize that under movement. And this as well, damage base max walk speed, movement. Hop our buttons, we're gonna put that under our gameplay ability UI. Hop our abilities, we're gonna put that under our gameplay abilities. And current health ratio, we're gonna put that under health. So compile and save, and we are ready to test this with our speed. All right, I'm running at a normal speed, activate the air ability, running at a very fast speed when we activate our ability. Now we gotta get hurt. And fall. 
And let's do it one more time, just so that we can take some significant damage here. All right, I'm going to turn off the air ability, and oh, there we go. It already looks pretty good. It looks like we're limping, right? But I think we can change the animation a bit to really give him an accurate limping animation, really give that visual indicator to the player that our character, he's hurt. So we're going to do this by creating a brand new 1D blend space, and it's going to share a lot of the walk-run animations and the sprinting animation that we set up two episodes ago. But the key difference with this new 1D blend space is that we're going to use an injured running animation. So to get started, let's first bring in the injured running animation that we need. And I originally got this animation from Mixamo, but I ran into the same two-step versus six-step problem that we ran into two episodes ago. So I ended up just converting it to a six-step animation, and it's linked in the description below if you want to download it. And so for me, I'm just going to open up a new content browser here, and then I'm just going to drag our injured animation in. And this is already mapped directly to our new UE5 mannequin. So I can just drag it in here. And for our skeleton, I'll select SK mannequin. And one thing here, make sure your import translation is set to negative six for the Z, and then import. And let's take a look at that. So the first thing I'm going to do, we're going to pause it, and we're going to add our anim notifies for our left and our right foot. So I'll drag this all the way back to the start. So right about there is our left foot. So right click, add notify, skeleton notify, left foot plant. You know how this goes. And because it's kind of a limping animation, there's going to be a larger than normal gap between the left and right foot plants every two. So that's looking good. Let's save this. We can exit out. So then I'm going to go back to my content drawer. We're going to go under Manny, and we're going to duplicate our BSMM Walk Run 1D Blend Space. So right click, duplicate, and I'm just going to name it BSMM Damaged Walk Run and get rid of the one at the end. So we got to make a few unique updates to this. So double click to go into it. So I'm going to get to my new content browser. I'm going to take our injured run. We're going to drag and replace our MM run forward. But I'm going to adjust the rate scale here to be 2.18. I know that's kind of an arbitrary number, but just got to this through a lot of testing. But now to make sure that this blends properly with walking, let's drag in a brand new animation, the same animation. So injured run for UE4, we're going to drag it in right at about 231. So you can get it as close to that diamond as you want, drag it in. And that's going to show up at the bottom here and just make that 231. And you can keep the rate scale for that one 1.0. So now we have to figure out how to blend these two blend spaces together. And we're going to do it based on how much damage our player has actually taken. So basically anything over 501, regardless of the amount of damage that they've taken, they're going to have that sprinting animation that we set up two episodes ago. And anything below 230, they're just going to have the regular walk animation. And I figure in the future I might change that to something like a crouching animation for sneaking around, something like that. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. we got to go back to our third person animation blueprint. And I'm going to go under the anim graph into our locomotion state machine. And specifically I'm going to go into the walk run state here. Now all of this stuff, you probably don't have that if you haven't been following along with this series, but you definitely have this BSMM walk run, and this is the blend space that automatically changes animations based on our player's ground speed. And so for this, what we're going to do is we're going to use what's called a blend node, and that's going to allow us to blend between two different blend spaces, and it's going to blend based on the amount of damage that our player's taken. So by default, our alpha is actually going to be set to 1. And so that means it's only going to be the B. So I'm going to take this, we're going to connect it up to the B. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag in a reference to our second blend space. So MM damaged walk run, drag that in. Got our other blend space. I'm going to take our ground speed. We're going to duplicate that. And I'm going to connect that up here. And then I can connect this up to the A. And so the alpha here, this is going to determine the rate at which these two blend together. So if this is 1, it's going to be all B. And if it's 0, it's going to be all A. So we need the amount of damage that our player has taken to change this alpha. And so for that, what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to get a reference to our third person character. And then what we got to do is we need the two variables of our current health, and we also need our max health. So I'll get references to both of those. And we need to get what fraction of our max health our current health is. So for that, I'm going to divide current health by max health. But just in testing this out, I never want our running to be fully damaged, meaning I never want this to go more than 50%. I always want this to vary between either 100% here or at a minimum 50% of both. And so to get that effect, what I'm going to do is divide this by 2, and then I'm going to add 0.5. And that way it's never going to drop below 0.5. I'm going to move all these over, make a little bit more space. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp this between, clamp float, between 0.5 minimum and max of 1. Connect that up to the alpha. So we are ready to start testing this. We're going to run into some problems, but we're going to solve them. So compile and save, and let's test. So first thing is, got to get injured. Let's get a little bit more injured. 
Let's turn off the ability. So we see our first problem, and that is we get double footstep sounds. And the reason we're getting double footstep sounds is because the footstep sounds of both of these different animations that are playing off of these blend spaces, both sets of footstep sounds are playing. But luckily there's a very easy fix for this. So I'm gonna go back into our damage walk run blend space. And what we need to do is we need to slightly adjust every single one of these animations. So if I browse to this and we go into that, I'm just gonna pause this because we need to go in each of these events here and we need to set our trigger weight threshold for all of these to be 0.5. And what that means is that if the animation is playing at more than 50%, then this is going to play. But if it's less than 50%, then this event will never play. And so that way we're always gonna get just one set of animation sounds. But actually what I'm gonna do so that we get the injured run, I'm gonna set this to be like 0.75. And the others, when we're in the non-injured run, that's gonna be set to 0.25. So for each of these, 0.75. And that way we're actually gonna get the sounds where the injured event is occurring. So save that. So MM walk forward, browse to that, open that up. So here we can just set each of these to be 0.5. Save that, two more animations. So back to our damaged. We don't need to worry about our walk in place. So we'll go into our fast run animation. We're gonna do the same thing with 0.5 for that. In the last one, we have to go into our regular blend space here. We gotta go into our regular run animation. So I'll navigate to that and then open that up. In this one, I'm just gonna set to 0 0.25, 0 0.25. And that's then going to defer to the 0 0.75 if our player is injured at all, or if they're beyond just a little bit injured. So we'll save that and let's test this out again. All right, so I'm pretty injured now. Yeah, heavy injury, turned off our ability. And there we go, one set of footstep sounds. But you see another problem here, right? So he appears to be moving much faster than the animation's actually showing. Like the limp is fine, but he's just moving too fast. So I have kind of a weird solution to this. And if you have a better solution, I'd be really interested to know. So please post in the comments below. Uh, but the solution I came up with, it did work pretty well. It's just kind of strange. So I'll go through it. So we're gonna exit out of our run forward animation, go back to our animation blueprint, the walk run here. And my solution to this is basically to speed up this blend space based on how much our player is injured. So first what I'm gonna do is right here, I'm gonna make this into a macro very similar to what we did on the third person character. And you see here, there's no option to collapse to macro. I'm not sure why that is when you're in a state machine, but you can't do it in a state machine. So we'll just come over here to macros on the left, hit plus sign, and we'll call this our current health ratio. And then what I can do is back in our walk run state, then I can copy this, paste it into our current health ratio, connect it up to the output here. And I just move over the input to the left compile and save, and then we can use that current health ratio in our state. So I can take this out, I can drag in our current health ratio, connect this up just like that. And the reason I made this into a macro is because then it gets a lot easier to do what I wanna do adjusting the speed up here. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass in a much higher value than just the regular ground speed into this blend space when the player's damaged. But it needs to scale based on how much the player's damaged, right? So from here, what I found to work really well is if we do a square root, so SQRT, and that's gonna get us closer to one than the actual ratio is here. And then I'm gonna move these over a little bit, make some space, because then what we gotta do is a subtract, and this is actually gonna be connected up to the bottom pin. I'll hold Alt and then discontinue the top pin, and it's gonna be subtracted from one. So basically we're getting the difference between our current health ratio, the square root of that, and one. And then from that, we're gonna multiply this to our ground speed. So we're still gonna get our ground speed, and we're gonna multiply. And so then I'm gonna disconnect this ground speed here because we're gonna use this by adding it to what's up above. So this is going to be connected to here. This is going to be connected to here. So you got to think of it this way. So if our current health ratio is very low, then this is going to be a higher number because one minus that is going to be a higher number. And multiplying by our ground speed and then adding it to our ground speed, well, it's basically adding a multiplier to our ground speed. And that multiplier will increase based on the amount of damage that our player is taking. And then we can connect this up. And the last thing is kind of weird, but this way they're going to blend at the same rate. We're going to connect this up here as well. And what that's gonna do is when our current health ratio is one, one, the square root of one is one, one minus one is zero, zero times ground speed is zero, zero plus ground speed is our ground speed. This is just gonna be normal ground speed. I know that's a lot, I know it's kind of weird. Uh, if you have a better solution for making this actually appear to walk at the right rate, I'm all ears, but this actually worked really well for me. So compile and save. On to the next test. All right, our player is gonna be heavily damaged. We can first test this out by sprinting. This is our sprinting animation. Still looks okay to me. We turn off sprinting. 
And now he appears to be limping running at what appears to me to be a pretty close match to his actual speed. The only issue with this is when I toggle to walking via caps lock, it is way too slow relative to how quickly he's actually moving along the ground. So back in our animation graph, we're gonna do one more blend and I'm gonna move all of this out just a little bit. And this, we're gonna do a blend poses by bool. Blend poses by bool. I gotta turn off my caps lock. So my solution to this is really simple. So we're gonna hook up our regular blend space to this. And when our walk speed, when our run speed is below 230, then it's gonna use just a regular blend space, even if the player's damaged. But then if movement speed is above 230, then this true pose is gonna kick in and it's gonna do all of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a reference to our ground speed, copy that, paste it in. And if this is greater than 230, connect this up to the active value. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take all of this stuff over here. We're gonna move it up a little bit. And next I can just get a copy of our BSMM walk run, a regular walk run blend space. We're gonna connect that up to the false pin. And then the ground speed's gonna be connected up to the speed right here. And what I found to work well blending the two of these is our true blend time is about 0.5 seconds and false to be 0.2. So compile and save and one final test of walking. So I'm heavily damaged, currently running, toggle to walking. Much smoother, back to our regular 230 walk speed. Back to running, yep, and he's right back to limping along. So the next thing we're gonna set up is an injured idle animation. In this one, I promise, much easier than what we just did. So for that, I'm gonna go right back to locomotion and now into our idle state. And for this, we're gonna use an injured idle animation directly from Mixamo. And I've got a reference to it in the spreadsheet linked in the description below. So here's the injured idle animation I got from Mixamo and then retargeted. I can just drag it in here. And what I found in using this is that the lower part of the body, it just didn't blend well with this. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna blend above the waist. And so for that, if I move both of these out a little bit, so we're going to do what's called a layered blend per bone. Layered blend per bone. And we've done this before in our fireball episode, but we did it in the atom graph for the entire upper body. And so I'll hook this up here. And for our blend weight, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get our current health ratio, and then we're gonna do a minus. I'll connect it up to the lower pin because it's actually going to be one minus, and then connect this up to the blend weights. And so to get this blending only above the waist, what I'm gonna do is select it, and then under index branch filters, we have to hit a plus sign, and under the first index here, I'm just gonna put spine underscore zero one, and the blend depth set that to one. So let's compile and save, and you should already be seeing your character there kind of idling not so healthily. And let's test this out. And so the first thing to test here is when he's at 100% health, make sure that the regular idle animation is still going, and so far so good. But now, let's start injuring him. Makes me feel kind of a jerk, but we gotta test this. Our poor Manny here, he's uh, really taken a beating, so I'm gonna have to give him some time off later. Maybe even paid time off. So the final thing that I'd like to set up this episode to indicate that our player is damaged is a heartbeat sound, but not just a static, unchanging heartbeat that increases in volume. I'm going to use three different heartbeat sounds, all from Zapsplat, and we're going to increase the speed at which the heartbeat sound is occurring based on how much damage the player has taken. So first, let me show you how I set up these sounds for Zapsplat. So if we go to our content drawer, and I'm going to navigate over to content, and then to sounds, and these are under character, under human, I created a new folder for heartbeats. And so for this, I have three sets of heartbeat sounds. We have our fastest, we have fast, and we have medium. And I created three different cues for these. And it's basically three free sound files that you can download from Zapsplat. And you can get links to these just like everything else in the spreadsheet that's linked in the description below. But to get these heartbeat sounds ready for Unreal Engine, I basically needed to bring them into Audacity, separate them out into separate sound files, export them using export multiple, and then I brought them back into Audacity to ensure that they all started immediately at the beginning of the sound. But once I brought them into Unreal Engine, I just created a single queue from all of them. So the way you do that is you select all of them and you right click and create single queue. Very fast. But let's go into the queue and I'll show you what I did there. So for the fastest heartbeat sound, it's just set to a volume multiplier of 0.9. And we don't need attenuation for any of these because they're just going to play. Only our player is going to hear it. And then if we go into the fast heartbeat cue, the volume for that I set to be 0.3, so much quieter. And the last one, if I go under medium heartbeat cue, that's 0.15, even quieter. And I found initially that these were a little bit too loud. I found them kind of annoying. But then when I lowered the volume considerably, then it got a lot less annoying. And it actually got useful to know, oh, I'm actually pretty damaged here. 
So if you do find these sounds a little annoying, I recommend two things. So number one, post in the comments below if you don't like the effect. And number two, just try lowering the volume multiplier slightly and see if you find it less annoying. Because again, we're trying to strike that fine balance between urgency for the player to know that they're really in a bad spot versus that annoyance. And so to set this up, we're gonna go back to our third person character and we're gonna create a new function. So under functions here, plus sign, this function is gonna be called player character, no all caps, player character heartbeat so we need to determine the thresholds by which each of these sound cues is going to play and i'm going to set those thresholds to be 60 percent and 30 percent respectively so damage that brings our player between 100 percent health and 60 percent health that's going to play the lightest cue and then 60 to 30 that's going to be the medium heartbeat and that speeds it up a little bit more and then below 30 percent health the player is going to be boom 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 boom, boom, boom really serious so under health, I'm going to start by getting our current health ratio macro. We're going to get whether or not that's greater than 0.6. And then I'm also going to get, because we're going to have two branches for this, whether or not it's greater than 0.3. And I'll connect this up to the first branch. Connect this up. And then we'll do a second branch. And the first one, the false pin, is going to be connected up here. Now for each of these, this is going to be really simple. We are going to right click and spawn sound attached. And what are we attaching to? I decided to just attach it directly to the capsule because there's no attenuation on this. It really doesn't matter, but I just attached it to the capsule because the capsule is the parent component. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on this. We're going to promote it to a local variable. And the reason we're promoting this to a variable is we're going to adjust the volume based on the current health ratio. So I'm going to rename it down here, rename, and that's going to be our local heartbeat sound. And then what I can do is I can just copy this, paste it two more times. So true is going to be connected up here. False is going to be connected here. True is going to be connected here. Add a little reroute. Move these into alignment. So now we got to specify the sounds. So this is going to be our medium heartbeat. Medium heartbeat. This is the lightest one. And this next one is going to be our fast heartbeat. And the last one is going to be the fastest heartbeat. Fastest heartbeat. So then from each of these, we are going to add a reroute so we can connect all three of these up because we're going to adjust them after the fact all in the same way. So we're going to get our current health ratio. And then from that, I'm going to do a minus subtract. But actually, I've got to connect it up to the bottom pin because the top pin, I'll disconnect that. That's going to be one. And then this is going to be clamped between zero and one because this is going to determine our volume. So we can get our local heartbeat sound get a reference, and then we're gonna set our volume multiplier. Connect this up and connect this up here. But then you heard me say that we wanna speed up our heartbeat based on how much damage our player has taken based on our current health, right? So how do we do that? So to do that, we are going to set a timer by function. And we've done that many times before, but I think this is the first time that we're actually going to vary up the time here because the time's going to vary based on our current health ratio. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this by 1.2. And where I got that number from is just trying to figure out how often do I want these heartbeat sounds to occur. So figuring a normal heartbeat, it's really gonna vary between about 70 beats per minute up to about 200 if the heart's really going. And so I just figure by getting our current health ratio, multiplying it by 1.2 and adding 0.3, that's gonna give us a good range where our heartbeat is relatively realistic. And in just playing with these numbers and how it sounded, this sounded good to me. So let's hook this up and we'll give it a whirl. But a couple things before we test. So the first thing is under player character heartbeat, I'm gonna give it a category of health. Last thing here, make sure to put our function name right here. So I'm gonna right click, rename, get that player character heartbeat verbatim, paste that there, compile and save. And then the very last thing, although we're looping this function, we're never calling it to begin with. So how do we get this whole heartbeat going? And for that, I'm gonna go back to the event graph and we gotta go all the way up to the top event begin play on the event graph. And then what we're gonna do is simply call the function, get our player's heartbeat started when we begin play which would make sense. Compile and save. All right, a little bit of damage. Yep, I hear it just very subtly. And now we're just gonna increase it. Yep, a little bit more intense. And now it's really going. I thought about making this effect breathing instead of heartbeats, but I find the heartbeat sound a little bit less annoying. If you still find it annoying and you have other ideas, please let me know in the comments below. So we're gonna finish this out with some easy cleanup. So let's go back to our third person character blueprint. 
and I'm gonna come back down to event any damage and I'm just gonna do one comment on these four nodes right here and that's going to be damage effects. So compile and save that and back in our animation blueprint. We're gonna do that for our idle animation here. That's gonna be blends idle and injured idle upper body based on current health. Back over to locomotion, we're gonna do the same thing for walk run. I'm gonna move these up a little bit. And the comment for this top portion, this is going to be damage run blend based on speed and damage. Animation accelerates the more the player is damaged. And actually I'm gonna extend this out there. So then I'm gonna come back down just a little bit. And then for these, we'll also comment here. Let me just move these over just a little bit. And then the comment here is gonna be below a speed of 230, normal walk animation regardless of damage. Compile and save. So that concludes our episode for today. But in our next episode, we're setting up post-process damage effects. And that includes the red indicator around the screen here, but also that flash effect that you just saw. So I hope to see you there.